Chapter 1 Glory Chasers The Anointing versus the Glory What is the Anointing? The origin of the word anointing was from a practice of shepherds during biblical times. Lice and other insects would often get into the wool of the sheep. These pests would get near the sheep's head and burrow to enter the sheep's ears. They infected the sheep so much they became sick and eventually die. So, the ancient shepherds poured oil on the sheep's head, making the wool slippery. This was done to make it impossible for insects to get close to the sheep's ear because they would slide right off of the oil. From this, the anointing, or the actual anointing oil, I should say, became symbolic of blessing, protection, and empowerment. The anointing of God is for a similar purpose. It is there to remove any spiritual insects of the enemy that will try to get in our ear and eventually kill us. It may not kill us physically. However, it can kill our financial harvest, our witness, our credibility as a believer in Christ, and worst of all, it can kill our vision for God's purpose. If Satan can get to our vision, he can destroy us. He knows where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29 verse 18 the anointing is the access code to the glory of God. Many people think the two are different. However, we can't have one without the other. The New Testament Greek word for anoint is the word kreo, which means to anoint or consecrate with rubbing or pouring of oil. By implication, this was the process to consecrate someone for office, either as a king, prophet, or to become a builder. This also signified God's blessing or call on that person's life. The anointing is vitally important for many reasons, the main one being because it gives the believer their identity in Christ. There are multitudes of believers who know how to get in God's presence. However, once it lifts, they are still lost about who they are in Him. Many backslide because they have no sense of direction in their calling for God. They don't understand their placement in church, the fivefold ministry, or their mission for God's kingdom. This is the reason why vast numbers of people hop from church to church and meeting to meeting, searching for validation of their calling. I want to address a few misconceptions about the anointing. It has been taught that when operating under the glory, we should not lay hands because then it becomes the anointing realm, not God's glory realm. This statement is very far from the truth. Laying hands does not mean we are moving under the anointing instead of the glory. Instead, it means we have transitioned to the point of contact position in God's glory. The reason many get tired when laying hands is due to the fact that they were operating in the flesh from the start. Jesus laid hands on thousands of people and never got tired. I explain this in more detail in chapter 3 under the subtitle, Hands-On Training. Many have wondered, was Jesus operating in the anointing or the glory when he laid hands on the people? I present the argument that the two are one and the same. According to Luke 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord, or the glory of God, is upon me, because he hath anointed me. And then he listed the things he was anointed to do. Remember, the anointing means to smear upon, rub, or pour upon. This means it comes upon us like the glory does. Therefore, yokes get destroyed because of the anointing or anointing oil. See Isaiah 10, verse 27. Without the use of the anointing, people will stay stuck in bondage. I have been to many glory gatherings and seen people experience signs and wonders and some healings. I have also seen many leave those same meetings still broken, oppressed, depressed, 
and unfulfilled. Someone asked me one day, Why is this so? I told them the people left unchanged because they experienced an atmospheric touch. However, they weren't anointed to receive an infilling that would have allowed them to remain in that realm. Once they returned to their homes, that experience that was in the meeting lifted because their atmosphere at home was totally different. Glory realm atmospheres can lift or be hindered for various reasons. However, an impartation of the anointing remains whether it is in seed form or full measure within that individual. If someone receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is in them forever. On the other hand, an atmospheric glory, as many refer to it, can be removed through hindrances in worship. It can be because the church we are ministering in does not understand that realm. It can be because the people are so used to hands being laid on them to build their faith that they have received something. It can be because they don't have patience to tarry in the glory until something manifests. In the majority of cases, the atmosphere is not conducive for the glory cloud to come in or manifest. Many churches can get a cloud to come but don't have the patience to wait for the rain. This is where the anointing kicks in. There is no record of Jesus waiting for the atmosphere to be right before he moved in healing, deliverance, or creative miracles. Many people use the scripture in Luke 5 verse 17 to argue this claim because it mentions, The power of the Lord was present to heal them, which is true. However, this was actually talking about the strong anointing being upon Jesus to demonstrate healing. For example, the Apostle Peter was so anointed that it radiated through his body at such a far distance until even his own shadow healed the sick. That manifestation wasn't atmospheric, because if that was the case, they wouldn't have needed Peter or his shadow to receive their healing. Remember, they were living in an area where the miraculous was plentiful. However, it occurred not because of the atmosphere, but the anointing upon Peter's life created this phenomenon. The people even recognized and acknowledged that it was through his shadow that these miracles occurred. See Acts 5 verse 15. Jesus never waited for any opportune time to administer God's power. Instead, he just stepped into the realm of the Spirit through the anointing that was upon him, and miracles took place. Jesus was called the Christ, which means anointed one, not the glory one. If we want to be like Christ, we must seek to be anointed and move in his anointing. I don't make this next statement to brag or boast. However, I move very heavily in the glory realm or the atmospheric anointing of God's presence, for a better term. What I have noticed is that most people who operate in this realm can't function in any other facet of the anointing. They are so codependent on the atmospheric flow that they can't even lay hands on a simple headache and make it go away. If we only operate in this one position of the anointing, we cripple our capabilities to do more in the spirit realm. Many in the body of Christ have become lazy and afraid to step out to minister because they are waiting for a certain temperature in the spirit to arise. If you notice, Jesus never waited for a worship or praise team to be there to set the atmosphere for him to minister. Jesus was so used to engaging in a point of contact anointing until the Roman centurion had to urge him not to get up to come to his home. However, he urged Jesus to just send his word and his servant would be healed. See Matthew 8 verses 5 to 13. High faith is the principle we must put into action to operate effectively in the no point of contact realm. Jesus responded to the Roman centurion saying, I never saw such great faith in all of Israel. 
This type of miracle or manifestation will not take place in a conducive atmosphere. However, it will manifest in a high faith environment. Jesus never rebuked the disciples for not having enough glory or enough anointing. However, he did rebuke them for lack of faith. As we go from glory to glory, our faith must arise with each new level of glory. This is why the scriptures say, from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Romans 1 verse 17, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. The anointing reveals our true relationship with God. The measure of power that flows through us reveals how much we've been seeking God. In the glory, there is less work and warfare. However, I have seen many people become so lazy and dependent on the glory that when it lifts, they cannot bring any form of deliverance to the captives. When we constantly depend on one facet of God, we start to lose ground in other realms of the Spirit. In the glory, the Father fights for us. In the anointing, He allows us to stand up and fight for ourselves. This builds up our work ethic and endurance as soldiers in His kingdom. With the anointing, we are more than civilians. Therefore, we need to keep a military mindset and remind ourselves daily that we are not only sons and daughters of God, we are also soldiers in His army. The main point is that the anointing of God is just as important as moving in the glory realm, if not more so. Many don't have the patience to wait to move in the glory or wait for the atmosphere to be conducive. However, many have accepted Jesus and received the baptism and anointing of God. We just have to stir it up, step out on faith, and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. I would like to emphasize that this topic is not intended to disrespect or discredit those who believe only in the sovereign realm of God's glory. However, this was to give the body of believers a different facet on how to minister. We are already fully equipped. We just need to look inside ourselves and we will find ourselves and tap. What is the glory? I decided I wanted all the different facets of God's anointing. So, on my search, I ran into this new term called the glory realm. I had heard of the anointing of God before, but never heard of the glory realm. I began to search the scriptures concerning the word glory, and I found many definitions, translations, and explanations. What is glory? The word translated as glory in our English Bible comes from several Hebrew and Greek words with various meanings. For instance, many people are familiar with the Hebrew word kavod, which means splendor, honor, reverence, abundance, weight, or heaviness. The Greek word doxa means renown, praise, opinion, or the unspoken manifestation of God. All of these words have been translated as glory in various places in the Bible. The Hebrew word Shekinah is not in the Bible, but is used in Jewish theology to refer to the presence of God and is also found in the Targumim writings. The Targumim or Targum writings were spoken paraphrases, explanations, and expansions of the Jewish scriptures that the rabbi would give in the common language of the listeners. Shekinah refers to the majestic presence of God. It means to dwell or settle among men. I knew that was what I needed, so the hunt was on. This was all new to me, so I had to become a student of those who moved in the glory. I had to start at the beginning and work my way up. What was the difference? In my journey to discover this new realm of God's anointing called the glory realm, I needed to first understand what the difference was between the glory realm and the anointing. 
Listed below are the differences that I found in my search to understand both dimensions of God's ways of demonstrating His power. Let me explain. The Anointing 1. In the anointing, it's like taking the stairs, but being in the glory is like taking the elevator. Everything accelerates in the glory. 2. In the anointing, it may take time to see a result, while in the glory, it's instantaneous because time is removed from the equation. 3. In the anointing, I saw more healings and deliverances take place, but in the glory realm, I saw more created miracles and signs and wonders manifest. 4. In the anointing, there are levels and measures, but in the glory, there are dimensions and realms. 5. In the anointing, there is an infilling, but in the glory, there is more of an outpouring. 6. In the anointing, we have to work our faith. However, in the glory, we just rest and declare and decree from an open heaven. 7. In the anointing, God works with us according to Mark 16 verse 20. But in the glory, God does the work for us through the angelic assistance from an open heaven. Through this journey, it seemed that the glory realm was much easier and required less work ethic on my part. However, as I began to operate in this newfound discovery called the glory realm, I also saw some side effects to operating in this realm alone. The Glory 1. The glory displays how powerful God is, but the anointing shows how powerful we are in God. The anointing exposes how much we have God in us, not just around us through atmospheric help from above. 2. In the glory realm, there is rest. However, there is still a labor to enter into that rest before we can command or decree things from that realm. However, in the anointing, we can just step into action through faith or the quickening of the Spirit without tearing to get an atmosphere to show up. 3. In the glory, we may get a cloud to come, but it does not guarantee rain will fall upon the people and manifestation will happen. In the anointing, we have grown accustomed to our gift, whether it's a healing anointing, the prophetic, deliverance, etc. So we know how to work that gift through the unction and quickening of the Holy Spirit to the point of guaranteed results every time. This happens because now the Holy Spirit entrusts us with this gift through the anointing and praying for people. 4. The majority of the time, the glory realm is displayed in conferences, church settings, and spiritual functions. The reason being is that we have to set an atmosphere through a worship or praise team first before administering manifestations of God's glory. When we are operating in the anointing, we can go just about anywhere and display His power in the streets, grocery stores, hair salons, etc. My wife goes to the nail shops and salons often and people come out with makeup running down their faces and hair all out of place because she administered the anointing. People there were healed or delivered from demonic forces. She does this everywhere she goes. She is not bound because the atmosphere wasn't conducive or because she didn't have a band or radio to get her started. It's the anointing in her and upon her that makes it happen. The anointing and the glory both have their side effects. However, they are both needed and both work together for God's purpose and plan for the people. We can't have one without the other. My biggest issue is when I see a minister discredit the anointing or downplay it like it's a weaker version of God's power. I also disagree with ministers who teach about the anointing like it is an old-school version of the glory realm. 
in all actuality, they are both one and the same. One is atmospheric, and one is through point of contact. And if we recall, Jesus moved in both. If Jesus our Lord moved in both in his earthly ministry, so should we. Introduction into the Glory I was in Dallas for a revival led by a pastor I knew. The pastor had guest speakers coming from out of town, Sito and Lucy Rael. I was only used to the ministers I saw on Christian television. I'd heard about this glory business for several months. I'd seen YouTube clips of people like Joshua Mills who'd witnessed manifestations of gold dust. However, I wasn't quite sure if this stuff was real or not. I wanted the glory, but I didn't really know what I was asking for. I sat in the third row of this meeting. I watched gold dust fall from the pages of Lucy Rael's Bible. I also saw oil begin to drip from her hands. The icing on the cake was when blood started to flow out of her hand like the crucifixion of Jesus. I said to my friend, This lady is either a witch or this is all staged. Then she walked down the aisles and spoke words of knowledge over the people. At first, she passed me by, but then she backtracked to me and said, You're God's prophet, and don't question any more who you are. It was confirmation of the call I'd heard all along. All of a sudden, thick gold dust appeared in my hand, and the whole crowd started taking pictures. Lucy laid hands on me but only on my shoulder. I finally had an experience in the glory realm. Now, mind you, I still was not quite sure about Sister Lucy because I had heard rumors about her being fake and that the manifestation was all a hoax. I heard she was under T.L. Osborne's ministry at one time, even considered as one of his spiritual daughters. However, I told the Holy Spirit, if this is not real, I still want the authenticity of this manifestation. I believe that because of my prayer and the fact that my hunger was so strong for the glory and supernatural things of God, He honored my request. Even if we think something is from the enemy because it is strange to our theology or seemingly a hoax, we must still pray and ask for the authenticity of the manifestation. We must pray and believe that God will make His demonstration of power more potent than the enemy's. It is important to note that Satan is merely a copycat of God's anointing. Moses performed miracles similar to the Egyptians' magicians. However, Moses' snake was more potent than the Egyptian snakes and sorcery. Why do we think the Lord chose the snake miracle as a sign? Well. The answer is, he was testing that spirit, according to 1 John 4, verse 1. See, God foreknew that the Egyptians would manifest that snake miracle as a magical sign to challenge Moses. The Lord decided to manifest his sign first, knowing he would win the competition. Elijah also challenged the prophets of Baal with the same miracle, with the intent to show whose God was greater. The manifestation is not the issue, but it's the deity behind it that makes the difference. If a modern-day minister performs a snake miracle or a fire miracle in today's times, people will arrest him and scream, he is of the devil. We as believers must stop being afraid of manifestations we don't understand. Just ask the Holy Spirit, if this is of God, give it to me. If not, give me the original, godly version of this manifestation. It's just that simple. The only thing to really fear is making critical statements against a move of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to find ourselves blaspheming against God's Spirit because we don't understand certain things. The next time we find ourselves questioning a certain manifestation, just pray that prayer and watch God bring the true fruit forth from that encounter. 
When I later returned to Houston from that meeting, heavy gold dust started manifesting at our meetings. I asked the Lord to show me a scripture that confirmed the gold dust manifestations were from Him. He gave me Job 28 verse 6. The stones of it are the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. Wow! It was right there in scripture, even though the context was referring to wisdom. The revelation was that when we obtain the wisdom of God, the gold dust will appear. Once God gave me wisdom about the manifestations, the gold just began to pour and pour. I share this wisdom with you now, so let the golden glory fall. Sister Lucy introduced me to the glory in a way I had never experienced. I knew then that the best was yet to come. I had now entered into the glory realm. How to Tap into the Glory Realm Here are a few tips I used to tap into the glory realm of God. Speak of the Glory In Psalms 145 verses 11 to 12, the scriptures tell us, They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. To move in the glory realms, we must speak of the glory of God. I have learned that the more I speak on the subject of God's glory, the more it manifests in our meetings. Whatever we address will manifest. This goes for any subject concerning God's manifestation. This is why I tell people to really ponder on what they're going to name their conferences and events. Having the right name for the event will be one of the determining factors of what will manifest. When someone invites me out to a glory conference, I now know what to prepare for. It's the same when it comes to prophetic schools or conferences. I tune in my faith for that specific anointing because that's where the people's faith will be when I arrive. The scriptures say it like this in Romans 12, verse 6, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Wherever our faith level is, that's what will manifest when we minister to the people. I have also learned that we cannot manifest what our mind is not paying the most attention to. We cannot demonstrate what we are not willing to articulate. To articulate means the ability to speak fluently and coherently on a consistent basis. If we make an effort to expound on the subject of the glory of God, it will attract His presence in our lives and saturates our atmospheres with the splendor of His majesty. We must talk His presence to existence. Closed mouths don't get fed. Another principal key is to speak of His power daily. Daily conversations of God's power will put us in position to receive more authority from Him. Many believers think that God's glory is His power. However, this is not so. God's glory is His presence and His person. However, His power is a separate entity of God's glory. That's what we will see in scriptures like, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4, verse 6. Or like, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Matthew 6, verse 13. These verses show the difference between His glory, His power, and His Spirit. God's power in the Greek is the word dunamis, which means might, strength, marvelous works, and the ability to perform. God's dunamis power is for the purpose of growing the believer in sanctification and preparing them for heaven's glorification. His power is to help us identify with our God-like nature. 
This also allows them to simultaneously experience measures of that power in the earth realm. Without God's power, we are defenseless against the wiles of the devil. It is important to confess the power of God daily, whether it was demonstrated in the Bible or in our own personal encounters. As we begin to speak on it, that realm will open up and reenact the same demonstrations of power. For example, when Elisha, the student, captured his master Elijah's mantle, he went to the riverbed where his teacher had once performed a miracle, and he yelled, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Then, the riverbed split just like it did before for his master. 2 Kings 2, verse 14. The student Elisha wanted to recap what his leader demonstrated before him, and the results were the same. We must revisit the demonstrations of power God has performed in His Word and remind Him of those miracles. If He has done it in the past, we can experience it again in our present situation. So, the next time we are in need of an impossible miracle, we need to find a scripture or a past memory of a miracle to demonstrate our faith with. Then we yell, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Fasting Another tip to tap into the glory is found in Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. In the original Hebrew text, it means Adonai's glory will follow you. Notice that the glory of God will attach itself to us when we follow this principle. The context of this scripture was referring to the principles of fasting. Now, before you close the book and throw it on the shelf to collect dust, please hear me out. I know the subject of fasting is not the most sought-after principle, or practice in the body of Christ. However, it is one of the most important principles if we want to see God's glory on earth as it is in heaven. It is one of the main secrets to our ministry success and accomplishments. Let me expound on the subject matter. In Isaiah 58, verse 8, the author writes on the benefits of fasting to entice the reader's appetite for this ancient principle. The reason I use the word appetite is because fasting is not starving. It's actually feasting. When we engage in the principles of fasting, we are actually trading one food for another. We must transition from feasting on earthly food to feasting on the person of Jesus. John 6, verse 55, Jesus tells us, For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Jesus is the only nourishment we need during the time of fasting. John 6 verse 55 also refers to Christ suffering His own body so we can partake in His glory. Fasting is not suffering. Instead, it is supping on God's glory. The reason fasting gets such a bad reputation is that it requires a selfless mindset. It's for us to reject our natural appetite to satisfy God's appetite. It's a time for God the Father to feast off our prayers and praise. Next, I would like to make a statement through past experiences with all humility. Fasting brings our answers faster. Now, Most teachers on fasting will disagree with this statement and make alternative statements like, Fasting changes your mindset, but not God's. They make these statements to appear extra spiritual and humble. However, this is a false humility statement and unscriptural. Throughout the entire Bible, whenever fasting was implemented, God did the following. 1. God healed the lands and forgave sinful cities, like Nineveh, through repentance and fasting. 
See Jonah 3, verse 5. 2. He saved the chosen people through Esther's fasting. See Esther 4, verse 16. 3. Twice, he gave his word through Moses' fasting. See Exodus 24, verse 18, and chapter 34, verse 28. 4. Empowered Jesus for his earthly ministry when he fasted. See Luke 4, verses 1 to 14. 5. He heard Daniel's prayer the first day he decided to fast. See Daniel 10, verse 12. Cornelius was a Gentile who supported the Jewish community through prayers and giving alms. However, one day he incorporated fasting into his routine, after which an angel appeared to him, and that occurrence itself positioned him and his entire family to become the first Gentile believers to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See Acts 10, verse 30. From the few examples in Scripture I just gave, it seems as if God had a change of heart toward a matter whenever a people would humble themselves with prayer and fasting. I have seen stroke victims who were paralyzed on one side of their bodies get completely healed. They would run around the church brand new as a result of me doing a water fast for three days and three nights. I have witnessed blinded eyes completely open only after a five-day all-liquid fast. In addition to these miracles, after a 21-day juice and water fast, I have seen many crippled people walk and tumors completely dissolve. I have even seen money materialize in people's wallets, purses, and bank accounts after I prayed. I had only fasted for a half a day during that time. You might be asking yourself, what point is he trying to make? Well, basically, my point is, we don't have to kill ourselves to see God move mightily through us. To be honest with you, I haven't done many 40-day fasts. The longest periods of fasting I have done consistently were a lot of 21-day, water-only fasts. Then there are the 3-5 to five days of 24 hours around the clock dry fasting I do often, which are a killer. On those fasts, I eat no food or drink no water day and night. Those are the fasts that I put into practice the most. I want to emphasize that we don't have to do a 40-day water fast to do miracles like Jesus. I have seen those kinds of miracles just on a 3- or 5-day fast. 40-day fasts are powerful, don't get me wrong, I have done several myself. However, the key principle here is that successful fasting is accomplished by a consistent determination to apply it to our lifestyle, not a one-time practice. It must become a relationship ritual, not a religious routine. After reading this portion of the book, in your spare time, ask the Lord to give you a specific type of fast that will be suitable for you. Also, it is important to check with your physician to make sure your body can handle certain types of fasting, especially if you are taking any prescribed medications. Once we tap into the fasting principle, Adonai glory will follow us. The Principle of Desire Here is one of my favorite tips to tap into the glory. It basically sums up this entire book. This principle I'm referring to is more of a mindset than an actual practice. That subject I'm speaking of is the principle of desire. Let me explain. Desire is a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. In Hebrew, desire is the word ava, which means to crave, to incline, or longing. When we are trying to get closer to God and experience His glory, a longing must take place. I have learned that whatever I want out of life, it must first be birthed out through desire before I can see results. Mark 11 verse 24 tells us, Therefore I say unto you, 
What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. The main thing that sticks out here is what things soever we desire. We must know God doesn't mind us desiring things. The scripture says what things soever we desire shall be granted. The false humility doctrine has taught us not to desire things from God, only desire God. The reason we see no major manifestations in our day and age is because we think it's wrong to desire them. Our desire for God's blessings and manifestations does not take away from our desire to know Him. Matter of fact, it's through His blessings and manifestations that we learn of His unconditional love for us. The main reason we as modern-day believers don't see the gifts of the Spirit in full operation, like the early church did, is due to the lack of desire. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. We must eagerly desire spiritual gifts. I have heard many people, even anointed ministers in the faith, make unscriptural statements like, Don't desire the gifts. Only desire the gift giver. Even though this sounds holy and humble, it's still unscriptural. The Apostle Paul was urging us to pursue these manifestations of the Holy Spirit, especially the gift of prophecy. Whatever gift we desire, that gift will eventually attract itself to us. Paul then later said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Again, we see the Apostle Paul prompting us to desire the gifts or manifestations of God's Spirit. We have not, because we ask not. Proverbs 11 verse 23 says, The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. If we have been made righteous in Christ Jesus our Lord, then anything we desire is considered good in His sight. The more we desire things from Him, it shows our dependence and reliance on Him as our provider. Deuteronomy 14 verse 26 says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. This text was referring to the blessings that came with obeying the principles of tithing. I'm not here to emphasize tithing, so don't get nervous. I'm here to get us to realize how much the Lord wants us to desire material things. When we don't desire the blessings of the Lord or even the desires of our souls, it's like a child slapping the hand of a parent who's trying to feed them. Remember, in this passage, God commanded them to spend the money on themselves. When we don't enjoy the blessings, we reject the source they're coming from. The Lord wants us to delight ourselves in His provision. Psalms 37 verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The more we delight ourselves in the Lord, He will in turn grant us our heart's desires. This again shows us that the Lord doesn't mind us having our personal goals, dreams, and wants fulfilled. Psalms 21 verses 1 to 2 says, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and hast not withholden the request of his lips. We see again that when there is a rejoicing and enjoyment in the Lord, 
our prayer requests and heart's desires get answered. The problem with most believers is we don't have enough joy in our lives. We are either stressing, worrying, or depressed about certain factors in our lives that will not change until we learn to rejoice in the midst of it all. I urge everyone who is listening to this part of the book to make it an urgent assignment to rejoice regardless of their circumstances. I want us to also begin to desire more things from God. Desire spiritual gifts. Desire material gifts. And watch how the Lord begins to engulf us with His goodness and glory. How to Become a Glory Chaser To become a glory chaser, there are several laws or principles we must apply. 1. A chaser must learn and study what he or she is chasing. Intense study of a subject will activate what we like to call the law of attraction. In this law, we will discover principles that inevitably lead us to our desired objective. When we, as the chaser, sow seeds of interest, we will reap the attention of our target. That will then set off a chain reaction that will draw them, or it, to us. Here is a scripture reference. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. James 4, verse 8 Drawing is defined as a gravitational pull, or magnet, that forces two counterparts to connect. I tell people all the time, that every great man and woman of God I've had the privilege of coming in contact with had no choice but to encounter me. You may say, how is that? Well, I am a curious and inquisitive student, and that principle influenced their judgments about me and caused them to lower their guards and accept me into their circle. You may say, I don't want to chase after a man. I want to chase after God. Well, the same principle applies whether we are chasing after a man or God. If we're operating under the law of the student, it will cause the teacher to teach us. There is an old saying, When the student is ready, the teacher will come. Remember, the chase is always for learning purposes, whether directly from God or from an anointed mentor. So get prepared, because the teacher is coming. The quicker we learn how to chase, the less we wait for our big break. 2. Become a diligent seeker In Hebrews 11 verse 6, the scripture says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. There is a reward system for diligence, and once it's implemented, the possibilities are endless. The word diligent is from the Greek word spode, which means prompt, energetic, speed. It means striving after something, or swiftness to show zealous actions. We must move promptly in the things of the Spirit. Many believers need a thousand revelations and a million confirmations before we do the application. This is why we see little to no manifestation that we desire. It grieves me when I hear believers say, That's the third or fourth confirmation I've received. God has told them to start a business or write a book but because they are waiting for another confirmation, they end up forfeiting the promise that was attached to the original blessing. Now, when that person finally starts pursuing their vision, they encounter strong resistance because the anointing is no longer on that particular word of promise like before. The enemy has had time to discover the plan and protection that was on that Rema word, Once the devil realizes that protection has been lifted, he has access to destroy our plans and purpose. 
When this happens, the only solution is to bind the enemy and loose words of blessing to get the promise back. Quick obedience is the key to manifestation of the promise. Jesus said in Matthew 12 verse 29, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? A lack of diligence will force us into the role of a police officer. We must now storm the strong man's, the devil's house, arrest, bind him, and proceed to repossess the goods and promises he has stolen from us. Remember, the strong man is a thief, and the only goods he possesses are the ones he has stolen from us. If we fail to be diligent when God gives us a blessing for seeking Him, the enemy will gain the access codes to all of our blessings and steal them right from under us without being detected. The seeker must do more than seek to receive their reward. We must also be diligent. To be diligent, we must be energetic. That means we must be quick, prompt, and full of zeal. A person with zeal but no revelation will get further than someone with revelation and no zeal. The person with revelation thinks he has mastered that realm because of his or her obtained knowledge on the subject. That person becomes comfortable because he or she believes their revelation will seal their position in that realm. In all actuality, too much head knowledge inhibits our ability to complete a project. That's why God wants us to go back to our first love and regain the simplicity of a relationship with Him. See Revelation 2, verse 4. The body of Christ has turned obtaining God into a complex process. In reality, it only requires simple faith to receive Him. Now, the person with zeal will achieve quicker results because of their persistence which means to continue firmly despite obstacles. The person with zeal will face more warfare because of a lack of knowledge. However, experience becomes their best teacher. Consistent victories increase their confidence and compel them to keep going from glory to glory. When we become diligent seekers of God, no devil in hell can block our blessings. 3. Endurance Last but not least in the law or principle of becoming a glory chaser is the principle of endurance. In the course of our journey, we will encounter obstacles and hardships. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Our endurance of hardship will determine whether we are good soldiers for the Lord or not. The modern-day believer wants the white picket fence, the big house, and no trials and troubles. People of God, this is a false hope. Once we become a born-again believer, the fight is on. Most believers want to be civilians and not soldiers. According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of a civilian is a person not serving in the military as a firefighter or as a policeman. When we're a civilian and not a soldier for Christ, we can't fight the fiery darts of the enemy. When we're a civilian and not a soldier, we can't bind or arrest the devil because we don't carry the authority of a spiritual police officer or military personnel. When we're a civilian and not a soldier in God's army, we are basically left defenseless. Just as boot camp builds up the muscles of a soldier, having endurance will build up our spiritual authority. The objective of the boot camp, or hardship, is to break down the weak elements inside of an individual. This is done so that he or she may be reconfigured into a well-disciplined, combat-equipped, Demon killing machine. I don't know about you, but I refuse to have my destiny stolen from me. I am not afraid of facing my trials and hardships. 
I've heard stories of anointed men and women of God who didn't want to cast out demons because they retaliated against them. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. This is a command, not a choice or suggestion. If we don't manifest these signs, then we were not assigned. Let's learn to go where God tells us to go. Do what He tells us to do. And we will be what He wants us to be. And that's a glory chaser. I pray that everyone who listens to this chapter and these prayers becomes a glory chaser. Father God, let their zeal line up with your will. Bless their feet as they chase the cloud of your glory. May the King of glory come in and live with them in their homes, jobs, relationships, bodies, and families. In Jesus' name, Amen.